on Early Earth Conditions, Lemuria. Well, gentlemen, in order to understand the human being even better than we do now, let's look at the Earth. We simply cannot study our physical existence in isolation without including the Earth. When you visit museums of natural history, you sometimes find remains of animals and plants that lived here a long time ago. You can imagine that all sorts of things took place before these ancient plants and animals decayed to a certain point. You can understand that at best only the bones of certain animals have remained intact, whereas the muscles, soft tissue, the heart, and the other organs decayed soon after death. However, the bones have been preserved because mud and other such material got into them and they eventually became petrified. These petrified bones can be studied and give us an idea of what it was like on earth a long time ago. The earth back then could not have been as it is today because then totally different plants and animals lived on it and the species we know today could not have developed under the conditions of long ago. Obviously the earth must have looked quite different in the distant past. You will see that clearly from what I'll tell you about today. Early last century, around 1810, there lived a natural scientist by the name of Cuvier. It was said that just from looking at a bone he could get an idea of what an animal looked like. When we thoroughly study such petrified bones, even if we have only the bone of the forearm, for example the ulna, we can picture what the animal must have looked like. For a change in the structure of the whole of the whole directly affects the form of each part. Thus we can ascertain what the animal's body as a whole looked like just on the basis of a few bones. Of course, sometimes we can find complete skeletons of animals from the distant past, but even individual bones can give us a good idea of what things were like back then. I will now describe what the earth was like many thousands of years ago. I'll just tell you about it for now and later we'll go into more detail. This is what the earth was like at one time. Imagine the earth. I'll draw a bit of it here, but picture it without the solid mountains we know. Instead, that earth was just like the surface of our earth now after it has rained for several weeks. In fact, even muddier. Had we lived at that time, we would have had to swim and would have got very muddy in the process, or we'd have sunk into the soft mud. Well, back then there were no human beings as we know them. The earth was very muddy, and there were all kinds of things in it. When you go for a walk and collect rocks like the one brought in the other day, or when you go still farther into Switzerland and find even harder ones, imagine that all of those stones at one time were dissolved in the mud of the earth, just like salt can be dissolved in water. This was possible because the muddy this was possible because the muddy earth contained various acids that were able to dissolve all sorts of things. In a word, the surface of the earth consisted of a peculiar mud. And above the surface there wasn't an atmosphere as we know it, consisting only of not oxygen and nitrogen, but one that contained all kinds of acids in gaseous form. It contained even sulfuric acid and nitric acid gases. This tells you that human beings, as we know them, could not have lived there. These gases were not very concentrated, but they were nonetheless in the air, even if only in traces. The air around the earth at that time also had another peculiar characteristic. It was about as hot as you would be if you squeezed yourself into an old-fashioned village oven just heated up for baking bread. We would have found that temperature that temperature as uncomfortable as the smell of sulfuric acid. Above this layer of air there was another one. It was even warmer and formed clouds containing sulfuric acid, nitric acid gases and other substances. And it produced bolts of lightning and tremendous claps of thunder. This is what the surroundings of the earth looked like. To give it a name let's call this warmer layer fiery air. It was not blazing hot, as modern scientists incorrectly assume. It wasn't warmer than an oven ready for ba baking. 
Further down and closer to the earth, the layers got cooler. But let's call this upper layer fiery. What was below it we'll call earth mud. Now you have a rough idea of what it was like on the earth back then. At times the greenish-brown mud down on the earth got as hard and compact as a horse, horse's hoof, and then it dissolved again. Those times of hardening correspond, in a way, to what we call winter. When the sun was shining in the summer, the mud was liquefied again, and above it was the warm air containing all kinds of substances that later precipitated to the ground as the air purified itself. This condition later developed into a different one, during which peculiar animals lived in the fiery air. Their tails were flat and covered with scales, so that these animals were able to fly through the fiery air. Their wings and heads resembled those of bats. When the amount of harmful gases in the fiery air had decreased, these animals flew around up there. They were uniquely equipped for life in this environment. Of course, when the storms were particularly bad, and when there were terrible claps of thunder and lightning, they weren't too comfortable either. But when the weather eased up, when there was only a slight crackling and sheet lightning, they liked living in the air. These flying animals were even able to emit something like electricity and to send it down to the earth. If people had been living on the earth at that time, they would have felt the presence of a flock of such birds above them from from such electrical emissions. Indeed, those birds were small dragon birds, emitting electricity and living in the fiery air. You see, these creatures were extremely well and delicately built. They had extraordinarily keen senses. Eagles and vultures, which developed out of these ancient birds after many metamorphoses, retained only the keen sight from their ancestors. But these ancient creatures had senses for everything, particularly in their bat-like wings, which were very sensitive, about as sensitive as our eyes. With their wings, those birds were able to perceive everything that happened. For instance, when the moon was shining, they flapped their wings simply because they had such a pleasant sensation in them. Just as a happy dog wags its tail, so these birds flapped their wings. They enjoyed the moonlight. Then they would fly around and take special pleasure in creating delicate clouds of fire around themselves, something only fireflies can still do to nowadays. So in the moonlight they looked like shining clouds. That's what we would have seen in the air if we had lived back then, flocks of shining clouds. In sunshine the birds didn't feel like creating such shining clouds around themselves. Instead they contracted Move that again. Instead, they contracted and began to digest the substances they had taken in from the air, substances that had been dissolved in the air. To feed, they absorbed those substances, sucked them in. This food was then digested in the sunshine. Indeed, they were peculiar creatures, those dragon birds, living in the fiery air surrounding the earth. Further down on the muddy earth there were animals remarkable for their gigantic size. Footnote, at this point there is a gap in the transcript of this lecture. End of footnote. They lived on the earth half swimming and half wading in the mud. A few remains of these huge creatures have been found and can be seen in natural history museums. Those gigantic animals are called ichthyosaurs, literally fish lizards. We can say that the ichthyosaurs actually lived on the earth. They looked rather strange. Their head was like a dolphin's, although their mouth was softer, and their body was like that of a huge yet delicate lizard covered with very thick scales. They had huge triangular teeth like a crocodile's. They also had fins similar to those of a whale, but softer. With these they moved, half swimming and half wading, through the mud. But the strangest thing about these creatures was that they had huge eyes that emitted light. Well, if you had been alive then, you would have seen electrical dots up in the clouds, particularly during moonlit nights when the shining birds especially liked to fly around. And at dawn, you would have seen a gigantic light coming toward you with a body larger than that of a whale and fins to swim with through the soft mud, fins that stiffened when the creature came upon hardened mud. In some places, the mud covering the earth became as hard as a horse's hoof, 
hard enough for these animals to stand on it. Then they moved by turning their fins into hands that were internally flexible. Thus they could pad across the harder, horn-like and desert-like areas and swim where the mud got softer. If you had traveled then by boat, walking would have been totally impossible. You would have come upon such a gigantic animal and you would have climbed on it with a ladder. It would have been like mountain climbing today. You would indeed have encouraged a mountain of an animal. Excuse me, you, you would indeed have encountered a mountain of an animal, so to speak. So you see things were really different back then. Just as Cuvier could see what an animal must have been like by merely looking at one of its bones, so we can gather from the remains of these ichthyosaurs how they lived. We can see what they were able to do with their giant fins and that they had huge eyes like a gigantic lantern that shone from afar so that one could have stepped out of the animal's way. Further down, deeper in the mud, there lived other animals. They thoroughly enjoyed wading and wallowing in the mud and always looked very dirty, covered with greenish-brown dirt. Occasionally these animals put their huge heads up into the softer mud. However, most of the time they padded around in it, depending on the ground having hardened in some areas. There they usually just lay in the mud like lazy pigs, coming to the surface only occasionally and sticking their heads out of the mud. As I said, we call the animals with the huge eyes ichthyosaurs. Those that lived closer to the earth are called plesiosaurs. The latter also had a whale-like body and a head like a lizard. Their eyes were on the sides of the head, while the ichthyosaurs had their huge shining eyes in the front of the head. The plesiosaur's whale-like body was completely covered with scales. The strange thing about them was that because of their greater laziness, and because they usually settled themselves comfortably on the firmer portions of the mud, swimming like huge boats through the mud soup, these plesiosaurs had four legs, which, though ungainly, helped them walk quite comfortably. The plesiosaurs no longer had fins, unlike the ichthyosaurs, who could stiffen and flatten out their fins and use them for support on harder sections of the earth. In contrast, the plesiosaurs had hand-like feet. We can also see from their remains that they must have had strong ribs. This, then, is the way things were on the ancient earth. The plesiosaurs led a lazy life down in the mud, and the ichthyosaurs swam and flew around. Yes, animals with fins could fly just above the ground. Above them, in semi-darkness and in moonlight, hovered the shining clouds of the dragon birds. That's how it was on the earth back then. As I said, the plesiosaurs were lazy fellows, but they had a reason for that. At that time, the earth itself was lazier than it is today. In our time, it rotates once every 24 hours. Well, at the time I've been describing, the earth rotated much more slowly and consequently many things were different then. That the air nowadays is so pure is due to the fact that the earth now rotates once every 24 hours. In other words, the earth has gradually become more diligent. Judged from our point of view, the dragon birds must have had the most com uncomfortable life. They were poorly off. Of course, they didn't see it that way, but had great pleasure and enjoyment in what we would consider a very poor life. You see, there were the ichthyosaurs, with their huge shining eyes, wading, swimming, or flying through the very warm air. And those shining eyes attracted the birds, just as light attracts a mosquito. The same thing happens on a small scale when you turn on a light and a mosquito sees it, flies up to it, and gets burned. Well, these birds up there were completely hypnotized by the ichthyosaur's huge eyes, flung themselves down, and were then eaten by the ichthyosaurs, who lived on what whizzed around in the air surrounding them. If you could have walked around on this strange ancient earth, you would have said, quote, These gigantic creatures are eating fire, close quote, for that is exactly what it looked like. Huge animals were flying around and eating fire that flew toward them through the air. At times the plesiosaurs also stuck their heads up out of the mud and their eyes shone too. Thus when the birds came swooping down, the plesiosaurs got their share too. 
All of this makes sense when we put all the facts together for a complete picture. The ichthyosaurs ate most of the fiery birds. The plesiosaurs got only what was left over. And just as the ribs of an undernourished dog show, so the plesiosaurs had protruding ribs. We can still see from their remains that they were malnourished in ancient times. You are probably thinking that the beautiful birds up there were poorly off. The fact is that they actually experienced pleasure in falling into the jaws of the ichthyosaurs. It was bliss to them. On the other hand, the fire-eaters themselves, although they had to eat, felt almost more uncomfortable than the ones that were being swallowed. The fiery birds blissfully threw themselves into the huge jaws, but the ichthyosaurs began to feel uncomfortable in their stomachs because electricity developed there. After all, the ichthyosaurs consisted almost only of stomach. There was little else in them. As a result of eating this fire and developing electricity, these huge creatures gradually became weaker. Of course, all this took a long time, for these fish creatures could stand even more than human beings of whom we have already said that they can cope with a lot. Over time, little by little, the ichthyosaurs became weaker and weaker. Their eyes shone less brightly and did not attract the birds as much as before. The ichthyosaurs began to suffer more and more from stomach aches. And what was the meaning of this? After all, everything in the world has its meaning. You see, as the ichthyosaurs were eating and digesting this fire, their stomachs changed to the point of not being stomachs any more. Finally, the animals themselves changed and took on different shapes. Modern science only tells us that there used to be different animals that gradually metamorphosed. This is no better than telling people that once upon a time God descended, took a lump of earth and formed Adam out of it. We understand the one as well as the other. But you will understand very well what I am now going to describe. Because the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs ate the dragon birds, their insides changed and they developed into different animals. A contributing factor to this development was the fact that the earth gradually began to rotate more quickly, not as fast as today, but faster than before, when it had been quite lazy. In addition, the substances that would have been harmful to later creatures precipitated out of the air and united with the earth. This is especially true of all sulfur compounds. Thus the air became more and more pure, though not as yet pure as it is now. In this later state, the air was more watery and permeated with dense water vapors. In a sense, the air had actually been clearer earlier because it was warmer and the substances it contained were more diffused. Later it cooled off and became very foggy. This fog enveloped the entire earth. Even under the influence of the sun, it did not completely lift. Then the mud gradually thickened and what later became rocks began to crystallize. The mud thickened, but it was still there. In some places it was compact, and in between there was still the more liquid brownish-green mud, and above all this there was a foggy air. Huge plants developed in this foggy air. The ferns you can now find in the forest are small compared to the huge fern-like plants that grew many, many thousands years ago, many, many thousands of years ago. These plants sunk shallow roots into the spongy, muddy earth wherever it had thickened a bit, and they rose up high and literally formed a forest of ferns. By then the surface of the earth had become a bit more compact and contained various types of stones that were not yet really hard, but had the consistency of wax. In between them there was mud everywhere, out of which these gigantic fern trees grew. They developed wherever there were a good number of rocks in the ground. And in between those areas there were empty ones that looked different. Neither the ichthyosaurs nor the plesiosaurs would have had any use for these big forests. The ground would have been too hard for the plesiosaurs. They would have become even dirtier, for a crust would have formed over their scales. The earth's surface had definitely become too hard for the ichthyosaurs. 
Both kinds of animals could not survive under these conditions. However, their fire-eating had already doomed them to extinction. If you had returned to this later stage in the earth's development, and later here means thousands and thousands of years later, you would have found it quite changed. Now different animals lived in the mud. Their remains, which have been preserved, allow us to picture what these animals looked like. Essentially, these creatures also consisted of huge stomachs. Their head resembled that of a seal, but was more plump. While the eyes of the very ancient ichthyosaurs gleamed, the eyes of these later creatures had become black. These animals had four rather clumsy feet that resembled hands, and their bodies were entirely covered with very fine hair. These creatures had a strange life in this ancient earth. At certain times they were far down in the mud where they moved about. Mainly they moved their chests, which were huge and were half lungs and half chests. Their lungs were still outside their bodies, as it were. At certain times these creatures swam and waded up to the forests and ate the fern trees. Out of fire eaters, plant eaters had evolved. They were entirely covered with something resembling woman's hair and had huge plump heads, like those of seals. If you had walked around at that time, you would have seen them breathe underwater and move into the forests. With their huge jaws, they ate as much as they could of the gigantic forests. These animals have survived into our time as what we now call sea cows. Uh, footnote, at this point there is a gap in the transcript of the lecture. End of footnote. Why did these animals develop? They evolved because their predecessors had eaten the air animals, and due to the electrical forces they had absorbed, their bodies had changed. The sea cows did not evolve directly from the ichthyosaurs, but from animals very similar to them. What these latter animals used to eat determined their outer shape. They were transformed through what they ate. These details must be added to what modern natural science tells us. You see, long ago the surface of the earth was much softer than it is today. The shapes of the animals I just spoke about developed because of what these creatures took in when they ate the air animals. Now the dragon birds also had to change their form because the air no longer contained the same substances as before. They gradually moved down closer to the earth and later turned into birds. Down on the earth, animals were always being transformed through what they ate. For instance, the plesiosaurs gradually developed four huge legs like pillars, a gigantic stomach, a plump seal's head, and a tail, but they kept their enormous size. If you step on a small wren, it is, of course, crushed under your foot. The creature I am describing was so huge that it could have stepped on an ostrich and crushed it. Compared to this ancient creature, the animals living on earth now would have been like mice next to the largest animals we know. Remains of this huge creature, which is called a megatherium, have been found. The megatheria moved around according to their constitution, that is slowly, or as fast as their pillar-like legs permitted. They lived on whatever flew out of the air, which had become different, into their huge jaws filled with sharp crocodile's teeth, though not as strong as those of their predecessors. Some of those early animals had somehow survived and were crawling around like crocodiles. However, they were usually trampled underfoot and crushed by the megatheria. That's how things were back then. And only now, after all these things had happened, did the air gradually clear and the water vapors disappear that had blocked the sun's rays like a veil, albeit a very thin one. Now in this later era the sun could shine fully upon the earth. But we must also consider the inner aspect of this entire matter. The animals I described, the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and later the sea cows or megatheria, all were fairly unintelligent, except maybe for the ichthyosaurs, which were smarter than the others. However, we can't say that that of the dragon birds up in the air, they were acutely sensitive. You may think that we human beings are truly clever because we would not voluntarily have flown into the ichthyosaur's jaws as those dragon birds did. However, I don't believe that's true. 
If you'd been a dragon bird at that time, you would have also done it. Those birds were intelligent. They were very sensitive to the moon and the sun, just as our eyes are. E-Y-E-S. But those birds perceive things with their entire bodies, especially with their wings. Bats, too, have such sensitive wings, though much smaller, of course. Thus the dragon birds were sensitive to the sun and the moon. As I said, they formed a shining electromagnetic sheath around themselves. And when the moon shone on this fiery air, the animals themselves, out of their own forces, began to glow, to shine and shimmer like fireflies. We don't need to overtax our imagination, but can deduce scientifically that these creatures had a different sensation of the starry sky than they had of a dark and starless one. They responded to starlight with a very pleasant sensation in their wings, and as a result their wings became speckled. To a certain extent we can even prove all these things nowadays if we observe very carefully. Of course, there's not much left of those birds since they had very soft bodies. We hardly even find fossil traces of them. However, close examination of softer, in quotes, fossils, particularly limestone fossils, has revealed wing imprints that can then be studied. Of course, this requires that we open our minds to it, rather than being as narrow-minded as professors often are. Though the dragon bird's wings are gone, of course, we can still find their imprints in limestone. If you look closely at the fossils, you also find traces of all sorts of stars. These are traces of the star's impression on those wings. I won't need to add much more before you say that all this sounds very much like what I told you the other day about the liver and the kidneys. We still carry in our bellies an image or replica of the conditions on the ancient earth. These dragon birds were like the eyes of the earth. That means, I can only briefly point this out now at the end of today's talk, that the entire earth was really a creature, a fish, and the gigantic animals moved around on the earth like the white blood cells do in our body. Our bodies, in a sense, are this earth. Incidentally, the white blood cells look like those ancient animals, only much smaller, of course. In other words, the earth as a whole was a huge fish, a gigantic animal, and the dragon birds were the ever-moving eyes with which the earth looked out into the cosmos. That the earth is now dead, excuse me, that the earth is dead now is only a later development. Originally it was as alive as we are now here in this lecture hall. The huge creatures I described, the megatheria, sea cows, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and so on, look very much like the white corpuscles moving around in our blood, only much larger. The dragon birds, in turn, behave very much like our eyes do, except that our eyes don't move around like those birds did. Thus at one time the earth was a huge, lazy animal that slowly rotated around its axis and looked out into the cosmos with its ever-moving eyes, the dragon birds. What I have described, the fire-eating and so on, all looks very much like processes taking place in our stomach and intestines. On the other hand, the dragon birds took a lot, excuse me, look a lot like the opposite of the white blood cells, namely the brain cells which extended into the eye, which extend into the eyes. In summary, you will understand the earth when you see it as a deceased animal. It was only after the earth had lost her own life that other beings could live here among them, as I will describe later, human beings. What happened to the giant creature earth is what would happen if we died and our white blood cells then turned into independent beings. Now we are faced with this huge corpse. It's no wonder that modern geologists, who can study only dead things, examine only this corpse of the earth. Scientists in general study only dead things. They dissect corpses. But if we really want to understand something, we must look at what is living. The earth was once alive and flew lazily through space as a giant creature. It could only look out of the eyes it had everywhere, namely the agile little dragon birds. 
All this is of considerable interest and we will go into more detail next time. We now have to go into more detail on the last subject I raised. Last time I talked about the strange creatures that inhabited the earth and how they lived. I also said that at one stage the earth itself was a living organism, a being. In various museums we still have remains of ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, megatheria and sea cows. When we study them we find that all these animals have one thing in common. Their bodies were enveloped by an armor of scales and they had strong heavy forearms or paws. They were so large that you could have taken a walk on them. You could have hit them with a big hammer without really hurting them because of their protective scale armor. All that is left of these ancient creatures, although in much smaller form, are turtles and crocodiles. Though they are much smaller, these animals are the descendants of those prehistoric creatures, which, as I said, wore an armor of horn plates. Let us now try to get an idea of how they developed their armor of horn plates. In order to investigate this matter, we have to begin with the smallest details. Imagine that a dog is injured. Animals have remarkable healing instincts, and you have probably noticed when a dog, what a dog does when it is injured. First of all, it usually licks the wound, insalivates it. Then the dog likes nothing better than lying in the sun and letting the sun shine upon the wound. What happens then? A kind of crust forms over the wound. We can picture it as follows. If the injury is here, see drawing over, the dog will cover the entire wound surface with saliva and then let the sun shine on it. The sun works upon the saliva and out of this con concoction a hard crust forms under which the wound can heal. Dogs have remarkable healing instincts out of which they take the right steps for healing themselves. Now we can enlarge on this. We can observe a strange phenomenon that will help us understand how the dog's wound heals. You know that we inhale air. In the process, oxygen enters and spreads throughout our bodies. This enables us to live. Without oxygen, we would suffocate immediately. What do we do in return? We are not very grateful to the air that gives us the oxygen. Instead, excuse me, inside our bodies, we combine the oxygen with carbon to form carbon dioxide, which we then exhale. We are actually quite ungrateful to our environment and constantly pollute it. If we were surrounded only by carbon dioxide, we would suffocate. The fresh air is transformed inside us. We exhale the product and actually pollute our environment with it. We constantly exhale carbon dioxide in which no human being or animal could survive. Thus you can see that animal life basically consists of inhaling life-sustaining substances out of the environment and giving back harmful ones in return. Animal life would soon be in a bad state if all creatures behaved as indecently as human beings and animals who pollute the air. If all forms of life did the same, the earth would long since have reached a condition where nothing could live any longer and the entire earth would be nothing but a huge cemetery. It is a good thing that plants do not behave so indecently, but do the opposite. Whereas we and the animals inhale oxygen and poison the air with the exhaled carbon dioxide, the plants inhale carbon dioxide, retain the carbon, and release the oxygen. Due to the existence of plants, especially of forests, life on earth can continue. If there were no forests, or if huge corporations were to cut down the trees, as they already do to some extent, life would become much more unhealthy. It is vital to understand that we need the forests. If we are merely interested in the lumber and cut down the trees, we gradually make life on earth impossible. We can say then that the way things stand on earth, human beings and animals actually behave badly because they pollute their environment whereas plants and forests regenerate it. You see, gentlemen, this is the way things are now, but they were not always like that. 
We must realize that the earth has changed and that it was quite different at the time I described a few days ago. If you went for a walk now, you could not come upon ichthyosaurs as you might have at that time. The earth changes constantly and will look different in the future. Yet what can you gather from all we have learned so far? You see that what we have inside ourselves and what we give off cannot sustain us. We must receive something in addition. At this stage in evolution we must receive what the plants can give us if we are to live. We cannot exist solely on what we have within ourselves. It would destroy us. You can see very clearly that what is useful and beneficial to us when we have it inside ourselves destroys us when it reaches us from the outside. For example, we would be in a bad state if we had too much oxygen in us, yet we must constantly get oxygen from the outside. In other words, substances that are harmful when inside us are of benefit when they reach us from outside, and those that are beneficial when inside us are noxious when they flow into us from the outside. It is very important to understand this. Now that we have understood that something has to flow into us that is different from what is inside us, let us return to the past again. In our imagination, let us go back to the period when ichthyosaurs were half swimming and half wading all over the earth, and when plesiosaurs were hopping around. You will remember what I said about those conditions. But there was also a period prior to this one. What were things like in very ancient times, even before the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs? Well, gentlemen, judging by the remains left by this distant past, the animals of that period were even more clumsy than the later ones. You know, you can study plesiosaurs in museums. You will see their gigantic size, their thick scale armor, heavy like a medieval knight's armor, and their awkward legs. You can imagine that these fellows were not nimble, or graceful at all, but terribly clumsy. But with all their physical awkwardness, they still had fin-like feet which enabled them to swim and to hold on to things. In a way they were modern creatures compared to the ones before them. Still earlier animals, which preceded the ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs and megatheria, were even more awkward because they had practically nothing but a soft body that was not very differentiated. There was something like a head up front, a fairly long tail at the back, and around everything an enormous scale armor. If you have ever seen an oyster, you can think of it as a tiny dwarf compared to these ancient creatures. Its entire body is jelly-like, slimy, and surrounded by a shell. If you now picture the shell slightly changed and covered with scales like a turtle's, and picture a soft oyster body inside it, you will get an idea of the animals that inhabited the earth prior to the ichthyosaurs and the megatheria. At that time the earth was of a thickish consistency, thicker than milk. The mountains we know today were still dissolved in it. The earth was a lump of fairly thick sauce in space. In it floated giant oysters which would have dwarfed this entire hall. They were so enormous that you could have drawn all of France on their backs. All of France would have easily fit there. The older ones of these animals were so huge because the earth as well was still huge. So there once lived on the earth gigantic creatures that consisted actually only of a jelly-like substance and that could only move the way our oysters do, except that the latter required much thinner water. These jelly-like creatures wore a gigantic armor like our turtles and swam around in the thickish liquid of the earth. You can compare the earth of that period with a huge bowl of thick soup containing dumplings. These you must imagine so solid on one side that you would lose some teeth biting into them and very soft on the other. Just imagine that you could remove the hard portion like a hat. The other part was so soft that you could have eaten it. It was softer than the thick liquid earth in which these creatures were floating. These ancient animals had something that you can still see today 
in certain small insects. For instance, you have probably all seen snails crawling along. You can follow their tracks because they leave a trail of slime. Nowadays the sun dries up the slime and so it does not have much significance. But in those very ancient times, when the earth was not yet completely solid, the animals I described also left such slime behind, which then mixed with a thick earth soup. These creatures were therefore of benefit to the earth. Nowadays you can observe only traces of such things. For instance, when you walk down a path after a good rainfall, especially around the Gertianum here, on rainy days earthworms crawl around everywhere. Where are they the rest of the time? They live in the earth, where they make tunnels to crawl through. You see, if it were not for these earthworms, our fields would be far less fertile, for the substances they leave behind change the soil. We should never get the idea that anything in nature is superfluous. The giant oysters in ancient times did something quite similar. They constantly excreted slime that renewed the liquid earth. But things were a bit different, are a bit different nowadays. No matter how much of these substances our snails and earthworms secrete and add to the earth, their excretions die off in the earth as it is now. We certainly profit from what earthworms and snails leave behind in the soil of fields and meadows. It is an excellent fertilizer when it sinks into the earth. But you see, what these animals give to the earth does not come alive. It does not have life forces. But in ancient times, when the giant oysters excreted substances into the liquid earth, something remarkable took place, something that occurs in a similar form even today. The fertilization process in most lower animals, and even in some more developed ones, is different from fertilization in higher animals and human beings. The females of fish, toads, and other amphibians deposit a clump of eggs somewhere, and the males then drop their semen on these eggs and fertilize them. The fertilization thus occurs outside the female's body. In other words, the female deposits the eggs somewhere and leaves, the male finds them, fertilizes them, and leaves as well. The fertilization process is fully external and will come to nothing if the sun does not shine upon these fertilized eggs. Without the sun they would die off, but if the sun shines on the fertilized eggs, they will develop into young animals. This process is still taking place in our time. At the time when these giant oysters swam around in the earth soup, the slime they excreted made it possible for new creatures like this to develop again and again out of the earth. The old ones died, but new ones developed out of the earth. Thus the earth itself gave birth to these very clumsy, gigantic animals and in turn was fertilized by their secretions. You can imagine then that at one time the entire earth was a living organism, a living being. Its life had to be sustained through the slime these creatures constantly excreted. If the thick earth soup had existed by itself, these huge animals would soon have died too. They excreted the slime and thus constantly maintained the life of the earth, enabling it, in turn, to give birth to new creatures, which again fertilized the earth and so forth. But they would have been unable to excrete the slime if it had not been for something else. I mentioned that the earth was like a thick soup, but the animal's slime was much thinner. How was it possible that the animals had slime of thinner consistency than the earth itself? At first glance we would think that it was impossible for lumps of thin slime to originate in the thickish liquid of the earth. You see, gentlemen, if you dissolve salt in a glass of water, it may happen that some of it sinks down and forms a deposit at the bottom of the glass. Now the water has become thinner than before, when all the salt was still dissolved in it. The thinner solution is near the top, and the thicker liquid is near the bottom. If you now turned the glass upside down, the entire salt solution would of course run out, and there would be no deposit. But this imaginary reversal illustrates the conditions of the ancient earth. In this thick earth soup lived the huge oysters. 
They had a scale armor at the top and slime below. What did their shells actually consist of? They were nothing else than deposited earth matter. Just as some salt will precipitate out of the, bo- of the solution and settle at the bottom, so the material for the shells had separated out of the thicker earth substance. However, it moved upward and formed a deposit there, while the thinner matter remained at the bottom. So in a manner of speaking, the reversed glass or head would rise out of the water. Only the salt, as it were, rose to the top. And what happened to this salt? Well, gentlemen, let us go back to what the dog does when it has a wound. First it licks the wound, and then it lets the sun shine upon it. The fluid on the surface thickens and kills something inside the wound. Otherwise bacteria would enter, enlarge the affected area, and the animal would die. You see, a sort of shell forms here, a a crust forms out of materials from inside. The slime-like liquid the dog puts onto the wound comes from its insides. When the sun shines on this liquid, the warmth thickens it. It was the same with ancient animals. The sun was shining upon this thick earth soup, and as a result certain areas within it thickened in the same way a scab develops upon a dog's wound. These became shells for the oysters. Underneath this thickened mass of the shells, the slime was now thinner. This is how the giant oysters came about. Yet they would not have been there if sun had not been shining upon them. Without sunshine they could not have existed. We thus have the strange phenomenon that in the daytime the sun shone upon the semi-liquid earth, drawing forth these huge oysters. But when it really comes down to it, it would not have benefited the earth, that while moving through this thick soup, the animals fertilized it by means of the thin slime they excreted. This by itself would not have been sufficient. The earth must have contained something else. It must have been similar to an egg. Only then could it have been properly fertilized. That is understandable, isn't it? Only if the earth had been like an egg could it have been fertilized. To understand that condition when the earth was a thick soup, we must examine how an egg can be fertilized. We have discussed the male creatures in ancient times, the ones that fertilize the earth. But then the entire earth would have had to be the female counterpart, a huge collective egg. How could that have been possible? If you wish to understand something like this, you have to observe the world around you closely. You will be surprised, but I have to draw your attention to something else for a moment, to something modern people no longer are fully conscious of. Yet it is not just because they want to appear mysterious that poets depict lovers walking in moonlight when they want to describe persons in love. The moon has indeed always strongly affected human imagination. You may think that this has nothing to do with our present topic, but it does. Moonlight activates our imagination. This is something quite remarkable. When the learned people of our time have an occasional burst of intelligence, they come up with some rather nice ideas. For instance, some time ago there was a learned man in Paris who realized that with all the medications we now have, we can achieve only very little. It is indeed quite remarkable that a scholar in Paris finally found this out. He thought that in order to improve people's health, one should perhaps do something different. You will be surprised to hear what he said. He advised people to read Goethe's Faust very thoroughly. Rather than take in all sorts of things that merely involve the intellect, he said they would be better off reading Faust because it stimulates the imagination, which is a good thing. Even such a learned man of the materialist school of thought encouraged people to read Goethe's Faust because it activates the imagination. He said that people nowadays are so clever and use only their intellect. But he claimed the intellect actually makes people ill. If they read Faust and immerse themselves in all its images, they will be much healthier. This learned man wanted people to imbue themselves with healthy vitality, with life forces. You see, an insight like this is a unique light-filled moment of which modern science does not have very many. 
Modern science here achieved a healthy understanding. Healthy because its application helps us digest better. This is really true. When reading Goethe's Faust, we digest better than when studying all other learned academic works. They ruin our digestion, but through Faust our stomachs become ever healthier, and so do the other organs. Why is this so? Because this play sprang out of imagination, not out of the intellect. Just think of this for a moment. Whenever people allow themselves to be influenced by the moon, their imagination is activated. More than anything else, the moon stimulates our growth forces, because these two are interrelated. Isn't it true that when we go for a walk in the moonlight, we feel a bit warmed through? In other words, we feel that our growth forces are being stimulated. Of course, nowadays this occurs only to a small extent. Yet the fact remains that the moon is connected with all aspects of human life. Let me mention a detail here that strongly indicates that the moon is indeed connected with life. Nowadays we are often reminded of things people in earlier times used to know. For example, I told you about the Roman head of Janus with its two faces. That will give you an idea that people used to know more than we do now. They were not more intelligent, but they certainly knew more. Nowadays, when all previous knowledge is buried under our intelligence, in quotes, we say, for example, that the unborn child is carried in the womb for nine months. Well, medicine has not only preserved Latin words, but also some of the old concepts. Although modern doctors do not want to have anything to do with the concepts of the past, some of these ideas are still around. One of them is that the unborn child is carried in the womb for ten months. How can this be, gentlemen? Well, you could figure it out for yourselves. One moon month is approximately 28 days. Ten times 28 is 280 days. You multiply about the same number, namely 270 days, if you multiply a calendar month of 30 days by nine. In other words, the nine months we have today are equivalent to ten lunar months. Both cover about the same period of time. In the past, the gestation period of the fetus in the womb was calculated in lunar months. Why was this so, gentlemen? It was like that because people then still knew that the development of the unborn child was connected with the moon. They simply knew, and we can rediscover through anthroposophical research, that only because of the moon can the fetus develop as a living being. But the moon affects only the females of the human and the animal kingdoms, because their constitution makes them susceptible to it. The moon no longer affects the earth, no longer produces eggs there, true enough. And yet, if we study this matter carefully, we find that there is more involved than a delicate stimulus to our imagination, and an activation of our growth forces when we go for a walk in moonlight. The moon has such a strong enlivening influence on the bodies of women and female animals that it alone bestows growth forces upon their children or young ones. But the moon does not enable the earth itself to grow because too much of our planet is already dead. If it was once possible for the earth to be fertilized, it must then have been much more alive than today. Now, remember what I said earlier. Whatever exists within us becomes harmful when we take it in from the outside. The moon, now shining upon the earth, can no longer produce life. Why? Because its light comes from the outside. This is as if the air we had just exhaled tried to get back into our bodies. It could not sustain life within us or enliven us. In our time, the moon cannot work any longer on the earth itself. It can affect only the bodies of human beings and animals because they are protected. But where must the moon once have been in order to make of the earth itself a living being? The moon could not have done that while being outside the earth. It must have been inside it. Just as carbon dioxide cannot keep us alive when it is outside our bodies, but must develop in a living way within us, so the light of the moon must at the same time have been inside the earth, not outside. 
Therefore, you must imagine, gentlemen, that at the time of these giant oysters the moon was not separate from the earth, but dissolved in its thickish soup. It had no clear boundaries and just formed a sphere of slightly thicker material than the rest. Thus it made the earth as a whole into an egg. The moon, which in our time affects only our imagination and the bodies of women and female animals, was at one time part of the earth. That means that at some time it must have moved away. You see, gentlemen, here we reach a tremendously important moment in the development of the earth. The moon, which in our time is always outside the earth, used to be inside it. Then the earth expelled it, and now the two are separate. When we study the body of the earth, we discover something remarkable. First of all, we find that it consists of water, in which continents, or land masses, in quotes, float, just as these gigantic animals once swam in the liquid earth. Europe, Asia, and Africa float in water, as these huge creatures once floated in the earth's soup. When we study the forms of the various land masses, we see that they look different from each other. We also notice from the hollowing out of the earth in various places, and from the receding continents, that the moon once separated from the earth in the area now called the Pacific. The moon was once inside the earth and then was expelled. It hardened only after it was outside the earth. Let us return to the old earth condition when it still contained the moon. Then the secretions of the moon gave the earth the function of mother, while the sun produced the, in quotes, fatherly substances, in constantly creating those lumps of slime and surrounding them with a thick coat of horn. These floating lumps of slime constantly fertilized what was underneath them in the earth soup, which was kept alive by the moon. The earth then was a huge egg, fertilized continuously by the influences of the sun. Well, gentlemen, if this situation had continued, it would have led to a very uncomfortable condition. The moon would have been cast out, the earth would have become infertile, and everything would have died after all. What happened instead? True, the moon was expelled, and the earth died. But some of the old fertilizing qualities were preserved within the bodies of female humans and animals. Before this expulsion of the moon, there was no birth as we know it now. Just as you take some of the old yeast and put it in the dough if you want to make a new loaf of bread, so some of the old moon substance remained in female bodies so that they could be fertilized. The egg thus fertilized is merely a reproduction of the ancient earth egg. It is no wonder that pregnancy, the length of time the unborn child is carried in the womb, is calculated on the basis of the moon phases. After all, the moon is still involved in reproduction. If you are a baron's son, you must live within the terms of the legacy your father left behind. The same is true for the fertilized egg, which actually derives from the ancient moon soup. It must still live by the moon's terms, because it has inherited its substance from the moon. In previous times, people generally knew more about these things. I will tell you some time why this was so. People used to know more about these matters and said that the sun had masculine qualities. It does actually create the masculine gender of beings. This is revealed, in a way, in the Latin language where Sol, the sun, is masculine, while Luna, the moon, is feminine. Sol, the sun quality, fertilizes Luna, the feminine element. In German this is reversed, and the word Zolna, sun, is feminine and the term Mond, moon, is masculine, even though in reality the sun represents masculine qualities and the moon feminine ones. Things got mixed up there. If we want to use language in the right way, we should give the word Zona, the masculine gender, and the term Mond, the feminine, Der Zona and Die Mond. Let me conclude today's lecture with a joke drawn from Latin. I want to indicate something here that will become clearer to us the next time. Let us say we first have the moon at the waxing stage and there's a drawing. 
it increases until it reaches the full condition. Then it begins to wane. You see, if you look at the corresponding terms within the Romance languages, for instance in French, which derives from Latin, you could compare the waning moon with the C and the waxing moon with the D, and they're on each end. And the C brings us to crotre, which means grove. Uh, readers aside, forgive my French. <laughs> and end of readers aside. However, when it resembles a C, the moon is waning instead of waxing or growing. The phase in which it resembles a D does not correspond to de croite either because now it is waxing. When we look at the sky, the moon seems to say, I grow, though in reality it is waning, and vice versa. This is how the saying, the moon tells lies, originated. But this example has a more profound significance. People were embarrassed to talk about the moon because it is connected with human procreation. The subject gradually turned into something people did not talk about. In the process, they lost the capacity to speak about moon qualities in the proper way. That is why the moon supposedly told lies. When people looked at it, it no longer indicated what they were related to. Doctors gradually dropped the habit of saying that the unborn child is carried in the mother's womb for ten lunar months, and instead spoke of nine sun months, which is approximately the same period of time. But in reality, this length of time is ten lunar months, not nine sun months. It has to do with the moon, and the fact that at one time the earth carried the moon in it, then gave birth to it, and cast it out into space. Basically, what I am telling you is not much different from what some people say about a primeval cosmic nebula, a kind of vapor, from which the earth eventually separated. Still later, the moon broke away from the earth. But all of this is the result of mechanistic and materialistic thinking. No matter how much substance flows out of a nebula, it could never become alive. You can produce as much steam in a kettle as you wish and then let some substances split off from it and be discharged. It doesn't matter. What I am telling you about, though, is not ancient vapor. What I am talking about leads you back to reality. Yes, this is reality. Not the nebula from which Jupiter and the Earth are supposed to have separated and the Earth supposedly expelled the moon when it was still like Jupiter. The real moon is connected with growth, development, and even with human reproduction, as I said. Furthermore, the earth at one time had its own reproductive energy and was fertilized by the sun and these huge animals. The moon forces in the earth were fertilized by the sunlight. You see how we have gradually enlarged our scope in this lecture from the earth to the universe. I realize that I have been making quite some demands on your attention. But on the other hand, you'll see that as a result, one can learn something of real importance. <laughs>